Alright, we are Watson back in Whitechapel because, you know, everything happens in Whitechapel in this game. So we're always in Whitechapel, but we're at this little bar here and we're going to go through the door and it's going to be super scary now. Let me in. I, I have news from Squibby, but stay calm. And who are you? Where's Squibby? He's out. To be honest, I don't actually know this Squibby chap. I was actually wondering if you knew Dr. Tumblety, a Canadian or American fellow. He came in... Sure we know him. Excellent. Can you... You know about gas? I'm afraid not. I am a doctor. Then I ain't interested. You can be leaving now. But if I find out who snitched to the peelers, I'll find you. Got it? But I can pay you for... Keep your coins for the paupers, or one of the gas boys who ain't afraid of nothing and knows how to hold his tongue. You bring him to me, I'll meet with you. Well, that was, I guess, less scary than I thought, maybe? Oi, what'll it be to drink, Gav? Gav? Goodbye, my friend. Oi! Yeah, 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 he's all... Oh, no, Gav? no, 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 I've been no. told the Dr. Tup... No, no, Goodbye, no. my friend. Oi! Yes, 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 okay. Um... So now we go, I don't know, police station maybe? Because they talked about Squibby. Yes, Doctor. I will take my leave. Huh? Goodbye, Doctor. Um... Do you know about gas? Anything else, Doctor? Nope. Pretty well. Goodbye. Good. Mm. You can always go and see if there's a party at the brothel. You're still there, Doctor. Very well. I shall let you see you. Okay. Um. Yes, Doctor? Well, farewell, Doctor. Goodbye, Doctor Watson. What exactly am I supposed to do now? What can I do for you, Doctor? Farewell, Isaac. Goodbye, Doctor. No, 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 no. Uh, and I presumably cannot go back to. I have no reason to go that way. Yeah. I could return to Baker Street, but I am still missing some information, and that would put Holmes in a devil of a mood. Well, drats. Um. Man, I don't know. Like, I mean. Hmm. I guess we could, you know. No, it would be better not to insist. Yeah, probably. Um, I am completely lost. Right. Now then. Oh, okay. So we can actually do that. I thought I couldn't. Never mind. Alright, so... I was looking for this waste paper basket, but I didn't find it. Oh, here it- oh, never mind. Here are the ripped statements. I can piece them together again. I thought that I couldn't do this, but I could. Oh, wait a minute. Do they rotate? Oh, they do. Um... No. No. 
maybe I'm sort of guessing at this point that seems to be that no okay so not that one no hmm interesting Mm-hmm. Hmm. It will all turn out all right, I think. Uh, aha. I see the problem here. Yeah. Oh, it was part of that. Oh, okay. I was wrong. I apparently was very wrong. All the witnesses seem to to state the same thing though about time. So, I mean, that's weird. There, all done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. <laughs> Testimony of E. Long. On the morning of the murder, the witness left her domicile at 32 Church Street at approximately 5 a.m. When she was already dead, apparently. To get to Spitalfields Market. She was passing down Hambury Street at about 5.30 a.m. The witness was certain of the time as she declares that she heard the clock at the Black Eagle Brewery on Brick Lane strike the half hour just before she entered the street. In front of 29 Hambury Street, she saw a man and a woman talking. It should be noted that the witness identified the body of Annie Chapman at the morgue as being the aforementioned woman. This identification was solicited by our services. The man seen with the victim is described by the witness as follows age at least 40 years old height a little taller than the woman with whom he was discussing approximately five feet three inches clothing brown deer stalker hat dark coat a doubt on this point general appearance of the working class particular markings dark hair and mustache mustache dark face looks looks like a foreigner the witness only saw the man from behind and couldn't be able to recognize or identify him the term foreigner is often associated with a person of jewish origin Weren't there two testimonies? Okay, there was apparently only one testimony now. Weird. Uh, right. Oh, there we go. Testimony of A. Kadash. The witness re resides at 27 Hambury Street, the building adjoining number 29 at the same of the same street, and the two respective backyards are separated by a wooden fence, tall and thin. On the morning of the murder, the witness got up at 5.15 a.m. and went into the yard where the latrine was. It was around 5.20 a.m. On going back into the house, the witness heard voices from behind the fence coming from number 29. The only word that he understood was no. He went into the building again, but returned to the yard approximately four minutes later, whereupon he heard a noise as if someone fell against the fence. He then departed for work. Then he, when he passed in front of the Spitalfields Church, it was approximately 5.32 a.m. Old police report concerning certain arrests. April 1886, at gunpoint from the White Plume Mountain Inn, also called the Kayak Affair, five years Dartmoor. Benjamin Benny the Scholar, faggot, 46, Houndstitch, falsifying bank records using false bank records, misappropriation of funds to the detriment of the Royal Bank of London, eight years Dartmoor. Jacob Levy, 30, Aldgate, theft of a weight of meat from his employer, Hyman Sampson, butcher at 58 Golston Street, Whitechapel, 20 months, Essex County Asylum. Ron Obvious. Sounds like Ron Possible. Or Ron... No, no, wait. Kim Possible and Ron Stoppable. Ron Stoppable, but this is Ron Obvious. 26. Address unknown, vagrancy, embezzlement, indecent assault, degradation of a religious building to the detriment of the authorities in charge of the Chichester Cathedral. City of London, lunatic asylum, entered indeterminate duration. James Longford Jim, Nazar, 20, Whitechapel. An old report on arrests that took place a few years earlier. Well, 
It would seem that I have all the information I need for my investigation. Anyway, this fellow Bluto at the Wasp's Nest is rather shady and doesn't look like he'll want to cooperate. I'd be better off returning to Baker Street. Holmes will certainly know what to do. And besides, I am worn out. Good. We can now go home. I think Holmes should uh, take, get, get a disguise. Let's like. go back to Baker Street. Home sweet home. Should get a disguise on. Be there we are, Holmes. I've told you in great detail everything that happened last night. Excellent work, Watson. We shall now be prepared to answer a few questions about the horrible murder in Hanbury Street. Do you think we are now in a position to find out the identity of the murderer of these two women? No, I don't think so. It's outside of our scope and not our responsibility. As much as you've done for Leather Apron and the affair with the pills, our mission is to help the police by ensuring that they don't get caught up following false leads and to point them in the right direction. Let us start from what we know with some certitude. As you have just said, it is almost certain that the same person killed the Bucks Row and Hanbury Street victims. The reason to assume as much are numerous and I shan't elaborate here. What do these two victims have in common? They didn't have anything in common. They knew people in common. They had the same profession. It's true. These two women were in the same profession, but... Indeed, Watson. These two women were both prostitutes. That is of vital importance, Watson. My memory from your examination of the scene is rather hazy. Didn't you say something about the killer's frame of mind? I was talking about the victim's possessions that were placed on the ground and the rings missing from Annie Chapman's fingers. This killer is a cunning predator, comes from a rather humble background and shows steely self-control in carrying out the murders. Something is puzzling me, Holmes. Richardson's testimony contradicts the time of death given by Dr. Phillips, which also matches my own, 4.30 a.m. And yes, we shall confirm that, Watson, and attempt to determine the precise time of death. In order to do that, we will need to place everyone involved on a timeline. Only after that will we be able to place the knife symbolizing our killer. <gasps> timeline! Let's look at our timeline, Watson. Like in Crimes and Punishments! Yeah, timeline. Termination of the exact time of Annie Chapman's murder in Hanbury Street. Sherlock and Watson arrive at the crime scene. Whoopsie Daisy. I I don't know. Wait. I don't know. Let's put the time of death as assessed by Dr. Phillips on the timeline. The assessment of the time of the murder given by Dr. Phillips and yourself, Watson, 4.30 a.m. We left the station at 6 o'clock and it took us 20 minutes to arrive at Hanbury Street. Our arrival at the scene occurred at around 6.20. Given the distance separating the two locations, we can deduce that the corpse wasn't discovered after 6 o'clock and therefore that the murder must have been committed before. Okay. Uh, uh, that was some old police report. Was this? Uh... Like from the inventory, the dialogue, and the two documents that so would permit you to determine the timeline of Chapman's death. Place the objects. Um. What? What am I doing? Okay. Um. What, what 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 am I doing? What? Okay. So I use some of these as Wait, if I 
Oh, I can use any document as proof. Oh my good lord. Okay, um... <sighs> I need... F um... That we can use as evidence. And we can use that as evidence. Okay, here we go. Miss Long sees a woman. Now, for the most important part, the testimony of Miss Long. She claims to have seen a woman speaking to a man near 29 Hanbury Street sometime around... What time, Watson? Um... Around... 5.30. Let us assume, therefore, that Miss Long's testimony is, as is most certainly the case, true. She places her meeting with the victim at around 5.30, claiming to have heard a clock chime on the half hour at the moment when she enters the street. Hmm? Mr. Kadosh is in his garden for a few minutes, then he goes back and Our hears next voices. witness is Albert Kadosh. He was in his garden at 5.15, I think. No, wait. Albert voices. Kadosh goes down into his garden at approximately 5.20 and on re-entering his home, hears voices in number 29's garden. Mm -hmm. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh goes back down into his garden approximately four minutes after having left it and hears the sound of an impact against the wooden fence. Mm. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh leaves the garden, enters his house, then leaves for work, seeing the clock on the Spitalfields church showing 5.32. Yeah, okay, then there are two Holmes statements. Or, no, no, two, two statements like these. No... She say anything? No. 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 Um. No. Reenactment with her apron. But footprints. No. There, that one testimony. No. Richardson's testimony, of course. Alright. Of course, Richard's testimony. Okay, so he... Something at... Um... Quarter to five. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. And he now, leaves. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. When did he leave? Like... No. Did he leave before five? Despite the great respect I have for Dr. Phillips and the value I place on our friendship, my deepest conviction is that both of you are mistaken and that Richardson is in the right and that these two testaments put down in writing have real worth. But how? Explain yourself, Holmes. Remember how you assessed the time of death? You touched the fingers and body of the victim, but it was remarkably cold for this time of year. 
In addition, the corpse had been drained of bodily fluids. Its heat retention was therefore no longer the same as that of an intact corpse. Egad! You're right, Holmes. Oh, I've had some time to research, Watson. Given these facts, my first diagnosis may have been off by half an hour, perhaps even an hour. Thus, we can confirm Richardson's statement and establish that the murder was committed after 4.50 a.m. and not before 4.30 a.m. Excellent, Watson. All our people are now in place. Yes, but Holmes, Miss Long, claims to have seen the victim at around 5.30. But according to Kadosh, someone, most certainly the victim and her murderer, was already in the garden at 5.30. Excellent observation, Watson. It must be noted, however, that these two witnesses, Long and Kadosh, saw the time shown on the clocks in the area, which are often inaccurate and went by their empirical and, in this case, erroneous estimate of how much time had passed. Thus, neither of these two times can be considered reliable. Do you mean to say that these two testimonies might match? Indeed, let's put Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30. Okay. Let's add Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30 a.m. Mr. Kadosh claims to have passed by the Spitalfields Church at 5.32, which, given the distance from 27 Hanbury Street, would mean he was still at home at 5.31. Let's therefore put the end of his testimony at 5.31. Uh, this one then. Wait. Oh, this one. No, no. Miss Long heard the man say to the victim, Will you... To which the victim responded, Yes, which would suggest that an agreement was reached and that the transaction was imminent. They then proceeded to enter the garden, which puts the voices heard by Kadosh at 5.29. Oh, okay. Uh, we, we had thought that Kadosh had left 27 Hanbury Street at 5.31 after having heard an impact against the fence. Thus, two minutes passed between the moment when Kadosh entered the house after having been in the garden the first time and the moment when he returns to go out again and leave for work. How long did he estimate this interval to be? Three to four minutes. In light of all this, Watson, we can finally establish the time of Chapman's murder. Now, place the knife at the exact time. Um, 29, 30? Now then, taking into account that the local clock isn't exact and that a young man was off by a minute or two in his estimations of his comings and goings, we can confirm Miss Long's testimony and place the time of the crime at approximately 5.30. But in that case, Holmes, the man that Miss Long saw is none other than... That's right, Watson. It was the Whitechapel killer. To think that Miss Long and Kadosh were only a few feet away from him. Indeed, Watson. Had Miss Long passed just a little closer to the victim and her assassin, or had the young Kadosh popped his head over the fence out of curiosity, the killer would most certainly already be behind bars. That's some stroke of luck he had there. I couldn't agree more, Watson. But his luck didn't end there, given the mutilations inflicted upon this poor woman. What must be considered, above all, is the killer's obvious wish to remove one and only one specific organ. His surgery pinpointed the exact spot, avoiding superfluous incisions. This suggests the man possesses at least a minimal anatomical knowledge. Are you suggesting a, a doctor or a butcher? Perhaps, but the possibilities are still too broad to conclude with any certainty. Now for the motive. Despite my almost complete lack of practical experience on the subject, I have a rather precise idea of the usefulness of a uterus and a vagina. Nonetheless, once they are separated from their usual envelope, I am more circumspect as to the uses one can make of them. What do you think, Watson? <laughs> you need a board, Watson. <laughs> lack of experience, yeah! You might possibly lack experience in having a uterus, <laughs> maybe. We need a board, Watson, okay. Here's a board, I think. There is nothing more to do here. Oh. Okay. Uh, where do we have a board, then? Oh, there's a board. Hey, board, come on. All right. In the medical university environment, students easily have access to a number of specimens. Perhaps it was intended as a study specimen. I have little faith in that theory. Hardly anything was taken from the Bucks Row victim. 
For this motive, it would have been easy to quickly remove something from the Bucks Row victim, Polly Nichols. No, wait, I don't know. Simply to supply human organ trafficking? I don't know, do you really traffic organ traffic uteruses? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Money, quite simply. Even if this motive seems incongruous, we're in no position to deny or affirm it until we know whether a market for human organs exists. No indication would suggest any type of ritual. Black magic? Watson, this line of investigation is far too vague. We don't have a single clue in support of such a motive. We can eliminate this hypothesis. The men here can push men to commit incredibly vile acts. Holmes, what if it was cannibalism? Even if the idea is unbearable, uh, we can't ignore it as a possibility. A desire for some sort of morbid trophy. I'd be inclined to dismiss this motive. If this were the case, why would nothing have been removed from the Bucks Row victim? Mmm, so I'm thinking... Elementary. What emerges from these possible motives for having removed the uterus from the second victim is that they implied that the killer could have carried out the same thing on the Bucks Row victim, yet didn't. This brings us to a terrible conclusion. Our killer has evolved in the space of only a few days, and if that's the case, had he already struck before the first murder to which we attribute him? And if the killer strikes again, what atrocity awaits his next victim? We have to stop him, Holmes. We shall do our best. This recent business of jar filled with formalin and of the American doctor might be a lead. Watson, inquire among medical circles to ascertain if there is a black market for human organs. The chances are slim, but this must be pursued. Very well. What about you, Holmes? I will send word to Inspector Abilene regarding our recent conclusions. I should also like to become a gas man and pay a visit to Bluto at the Wasp's Nest. Understood, Holmes. I think one of my old university colleagues who works at the London Hospital will be able to help me. I shall write him a note at once. He should be able to see me during the day. Afterwards, shall we meet here? Yes, Watson. See you later, and good luck. I must get to the London Hospital, where my old university colleague works. Oh, okay. We're Watson. Okay, but Holmes is totally going to get in costume and be like, Hey, I'm a gas man! Um, you're thinking, my Bob. Uh, London Hospital. All right, Watson. Now you know what. This is a pretty good place to take a break, actually. Yeah, it is because we're gonna go do a new thing, and it's gonna be all good. All right. Okay. <laughs> this game is. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's really, it's really good. It's really fun to play. So I'm happy I'm playing it. Um, thank you all very much for. Watching and sharing Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper with me. Um, I'll see y'all later.